So it's good to have you with us this morning. We are currently in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Uh, we left off in chapter 6, and we saw Jesus holding the title deed to planet Earth, which is the scroll that's sealed with seven seals. And in chapter 6, we saw the devastating effects as Jesus opens up the first six seals from the scroll. First one brought in the Antichrist. He comes on the scene with a false peace program. He's the counterfeit Messiah. He promises safety and peace to the inhabitants of the world. But everything quickly goes haywire as wars, famines, death spreads throughout the world. And that is quickly followed by all kinds of natural disasters. We saw there's a massive earthquake that will set off volcanic reactions throughout the world. Uh, meteorite and asteroids will pummel, 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 that works, pummel the earth, sure. And then, uh, and so it's going to be just brutal upon this planet. And as we saw at the end of chapter 6, most of the people realize that this is the wrath of God. This is the wrath of the Lamb, Lambo. Right? Lamb, it's kind of the wrath of the lamb doesn't make sense. Kind of an oxymoron. You don't think of lambs attacking. Uh, they usually don't. But Jesus is judging the world at this time for a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. And the people recognize this. They say, The wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That is how we ended chapter 6. And it's in here in chapter 7. We discover Jesus is not only removing uh, the seven seals from the scroll, but at the same time, he's placing a seal of protection upon uh, 144,000 people that we'll look at and figure out who they are, what they're going to be doing, and they're going to be protected throughout the seven-year Great Tribulation time, at least the first three and a half years. But um, who's able to stand against the wrath of God? Well, nobody except those whom God calls. So we pick up in chapter 7, and we read here in verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. First of all, let me just say that... Um, Chapter 7 is known as a parenthetical chapter. You can put a parenthesis around chapter 7, verse 1, down to verse 17, because this gives us additional insights into what's going on during this specific time frame. Uh, there's three parenthetical sections in Revelation where we're given greater detail into certain things that are happening on earth. And so the first thing we see here in verse 1 are these powerful angels. They position themselves in the four corners of the earth. This would be the four quadrants of the earth, north, east, south, west. You know, don't picture the earth like a square or a cube. It just means they're at the four quadrants, north, east, west, and south. And their job is this. It says here is to hold back the winds of the earth. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine such a thing if all the winds on planet earth stopped. And we saw in chapter 6, there's these volcanic eruptions. The sky is going to be filled with all kinds of volcanic ash and dust all over. Remember I mentioned Mount Krakatoa last week? That one mountain that blew in 1883, I believe it was, uh, changed the atmosphere of the earth and changed the temperatures for two or five years. It dropped the temperature two degrees over a five-year period. One volcano. There's going to be multiple volcanoes erupting during this time and known as the Pacific Rim. If you see that rim around the Pacific Ocean on the uh, the far west side of the Pacific Ocean, all the way down through North America, down to South America. There's so many active volcanoes, even today, and they will all be blowing their tops, all this ash dust all over the world, and then the wind stops. So you can imagine how heavy it's going to be, how just dirty everything's going to be. It's just going to be still. This is one of the reasons why the sun will not shine like it once did. We're going to see that later on. And then later it's going to scorch people. The sun's going to do amazing things during the Great Tribulation. But this is one of the reasons why uh, so many sea creatures are going to die, as we'll see. But no rain on the earth, no clouds. You know, you know the whole hydrological system is you have evaporation over the oceans. The wind blows the clouds over, drops rain and snow. So that will stop. So it's going to be brutal. We know for three and a half years that there's going to be no rain. And this is probably the reason why. The amazing thing about the Great Tribulation is we see God's hand of 
uh, power on display for all of the world to see, his amazing power over his creation. Uh, he's in complete control over every aspect of these final seven years on planet Earth. It's called the Great Tribulation for a reason, because it's God's wrath, his judgment poured out on this Christ-rejecting world. It's a seven-year period. It's also known as the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel was given 77s, 490 years. There's one seven-year period that has not been uh, it hasn't happened yet. Well, we know this is that seven-year period. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, which is another name for Israel. So God is directly dealing with the, the Jews during this time as well. So an amazing scene that we're going to see here is the angel stopped the winds from blowing on the earth. Look at verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it, uh, it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So the Apostle John sees this amazing scene as he watches this other angel come on the scene here, and he's bringing with him the seal of the living God. He is telling those four angels who are holding the winds back, don't harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until, it says, they've been sealed. These servants of God have been sealed with the very seal of God on their foreheads. Later on, we know that the sea will be... Uh, totally wiped out. All the oceans, uh, first of all, it'll be a third of all the oceans will be destroyed. All the living creatures in the ocean later on, towards the end of the tribulation, every sea creature is going to die. There's going to be trees, it says a third of all the trees and green grass are burned up. This is in chapter 8. But then later, all, every tree and all the green grass will be burned up. So it's going to get worse and worse as this great tribulation goes on. Nothing's going to happen, it says here, till he seals the servants of our God on their foreheads. The word seal, sealed, seals, it's used 32 times in the book of Revelation. 16 of those times are here in chapter 17, or 7. Chapter 7, we see 16 times the word seal is used. God has his seal, his stamp of ownership upon our lives, upon the 144,000, as we'll see here in a moment. In Revelation 14, 1, it says they're sealed with the name of God the Father. Now, what does that mean? Is it Yahweh? Is it Y-H-W-H? Jehovah? We don't know for sure, but God's going to put his name upon the 144,000. The Apostle John is familiar with this seal on the foreheads of God's people. We see this in Ezekiel. You know, the Jews knew all about what happened with Ezekiel when uh, he sees... Um, he was there when you know uh, Jerusalem is being destroyed by the Babylonians. Judah is getting you know wiped out, taken into captivity, and then he's given this picture of this guy with the mark of God that goes around Jerusalem, sealing people with the name of God on their foreheads. This is what we read in Ezekiel chapter nine, verse four. It says, "And the Lord said to him, so Ezekiel is watching this." Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. It goes on to say that all those who were rejecting God, they were rejecting the word of the Lord, they were all put to death. But those who were trusting the Lord, they're you know, weeping and mourning over the destruction of Israel, Jerusalem, they were spared. So here in Revelation 7, John sees this angel with the seal of God in his hand. And as we'll see, it's because of this seal on their foreheads that these 144,000 men who are men of God will be the only ones who will be completely protected throughout the seven-year Great Tribulation time. Everybody else will be affected in some way during the Great Tribulation. These are the only ones that are sealed with God's protection um, you go to a grocery store, everything's sealed, right? Now you can't find anything that's not sealed, it seems like. And if it's broken seal, don't use it. You know, all these warnings. You know, there's a time I went to the grocery store a few years back, and there was four seals on this stupid package. 
you know, you had take that seal off, you could open the box, you pull out a little container, there's another seal on that, you open it up, another seal on the lid there. I mean, it was just crazy. But it's sealed for your protection. Well, these guys are sealed for their protection by the seal of God. Now, don't forget the great imitator, the imposter, the Antichrist himself, he's going to require a mark upon every human being on planet Earth during the Great Tribulation known as the mark of the beast, 666, either on their right hand or on their forehead. So that's all he can do is imitate what God does. God has put a seal on these guys, and the Antichrist will put a seal, so to speak, on those who reject the Lord. In fact, those who receive the mark of the beast cannot be saved. I know there's a few theologians I've read, and they said, well, they're still able to get saved. God's grace is sufficient, even if they take the mark of the beast. Well, we'll see in Revelation, if you take the mark of the beast, there is no chance to be saved. That is the final straw, as far as God is concerned, if you take the 666. Satan, all he can do is try to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll try to sneak in and deceive people with empty promises. He offers his own brand of what he thinks this world is all about. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. Go for the gusto. Life is as much, you know, whatever you get out of it, this is all there is. This is as good as it's going to be. For all the people who want to be spiritual, Satan will offer them, you know, a thousand and one different religions, vain philosophies of men. Um, he's got a, so many things out there to try to get people distracted from Jesus, turn away from the Lord, and every single one of Satan's lies, his false religions, his vain philosophies lead to the lake of fire. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that only happens when you receive Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior. At that moment, Jesus washes all of your sins away. And as we talked about in communion, it's through his blood. At that moment, he forgives us of every sinful deed and action and thought we've ever had. At that moment, when Jesus came into our life, he caused us to become born again. And we're now spiritually alive to the Lord. At that moment, Jesus gave us everlasting, never-ending, eternal life, which means you will never be separated from God. That's his promise, if you're truly born again. Paul says it like this in Romans 8, starting in verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Jesus has done it all. He has done everything to save and secure our life for eternity. Um, you know, some people say, oh, I have life verses. Well, my life verses from when I first got saved, and it really struck me when I'm reading through the New Testament for the first time, was Ephesians chapter 2 especially verses 4 through 9. This is what it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love in which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so Jesus has truly done everything for securing our eternal salvation. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. That's how powerful his grace is towards us. Now there's something else that is important for us to understand about this scene here in Revelation 7. And that is, uh, the, these 144,000 believers in Christ are sealed with God's name at a specific time, probably towards the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and they're going to be used by God in tremendous ways during the Great Tribulation. But here's what's important to understand. For every single one of us in here who has received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are 
his. He's put his stamp of ownership upon your life. We already have God's stamp upon us, and that's awesome to realize because that means uh, we're not looking forward to being sealed. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you have been sealed. That's his guarantee that you're going to heaven if you have that stamp of ownership upon you. Jesus, if he's in your life, you're sealed. It's a done deal. You belong to God, and that should give you tremendous peace, especially in this day and age in which we are experiencing a lot of pressures from the world. You're just seeing politics going off the rails. You're just seeing so many things in this world that are just crazy. But we have tremendous confidence that when Satan tries to get you to doubt God's love for you and God's saving grace towards you, you can fall back and know, no, I belong to Jesus. He paid the price for me, which was his perfect spotless blood. That's why it's important for us to realize that as followers of Christ, we have already been sealed. Here's how the Apostle Paul explains it. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 13, it says, In him, in Christ, you also trusted, when? When did you trust him? After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So, you were saved when you heard the word of truth. You received the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And having believed, so you heard the gospel, then you believed, at that moment you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So we have this guarantee of eternal life until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Uh, Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 1.22. Speaking of God, Paul writes, Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You know, we talk about, you know, inviting Jesus to come into your heart. I mean, yeah, I understand what you're saying. We just receive Him into our lives as Lord and Savior. Here's the reason why. Because He's given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That's His stamp, His signet ring upon our lives that we belong to the Lord. And how wonderful and awesome it is that God has sealed us. The very Holy Spirit Himself has sealed us. And that is why we have such confidence in the Lord for our salvation. I don't know if you, you know, oh no, did I lose it today? Am I still saved? We can have confidence because if it was left up to me to save myself, I'd never do it. If it was left, left up to me to secure my salvation, maintain my salvation, I could never do it because I'd stumble and fall every time. But I praise the Lord. I thank Jesus all the time for His amazing grace, His saving power, because He alone has the power to get us through this life victoriously and to bring us to heaven when our life on earth is finished. That's why all the glory goes to Him, and we cannot pat ourselves in the back and say, look what I've done. I can rejoice with Paul. He says in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that He has begun a good work in you, did He begin a good work in you? Then He will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So we have been sealed by God, and that's the guarantee of His hand of protection and salvation upon our lives. It's, not, it's God's guarantee that we belong to Jesus and that Satan has no more rights to our lives any longer. Satan cannot possess a Christian. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Satan can hassle us. He can try to tempt us. He can try to get us discouraged and depressed, but he cannot come into our lives because we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Satan cannot break that seal. In fact, when we get to chapters 19 and 20, we see one of the first things that happens. Satan is going to be thrown into the bottomless pit, not the lake of fire, but the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And it says an angel puts a seal of God on that bottomless pit. He cannot break that seal and get out. God will let him out at the end of the thousand years, but Satan can't break that seal and get out for a thousand years. He cannot break the seal of God and get in to your life. 
If you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are safe, you're protected by the Lord. Again, I hope you realize how wonderful a truth that is. The seal of God is the guarantee. It's His promise that He'll never leave us, He'll never forsake us. So that's the main thing. If you get anything out of this message from chapter 7, is that you and I, as born-again Christians, if you're a make-believer, you're on your own. I don't, I'm not giving you any assurance of your salvation if you're pretending to be a Christian and you're really not. God knows your heart. I don't know your heart. But if you're truly born again, you have that guarantee of the seal of God upon your life. So look at verse 4 again. And, you know, a question is often asked, who are the 144,000? Where do they come from? What's this all about? Verse 4 again says, And I heard of the number of those who were sealed... 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And just so we're not confused on who he's referring to, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. I think there's a pattern here. Uh, of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, interesting, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Benjamin. 12,000 were sealed. So when you read of the 12 tribes of Israel, there's actually 14 at any given time. They're not always put in the same list, but they're always listed as the 12 tribes of Israel. There's two missing, if you notice. Ephraim and Dan are not in, on this list. Levi is many times not listed, but they're listed here. Joseph is usually not listed because his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, took two different tribes. But here he leaves off Ephraim and Dan. They were the first two that went uh, that led Israel into idolatry. And so for whatever reason, they're not on the list right here. When you get into the book of Ezekiel, and it has another list, both of those guys are named during the millennial reign of Christ, so God's not done with them yet. But here we think, or, or we know, God has 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And if it's not clear, God says, I'll even name which tribes I'm referring to. This is a huge problem for those who believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology says, God is done with the Jews. They blew it. They rejected Jesus. And so now it's all about the church. So the church has replaced Israel in the eyes of God. That is not true. God has an everlasting covenant with the Jews that he will fulfill at this time that we're seeing in the book of Revelation. The 70th week of Daniel is all about the Jewish people. Ezekiel 37 is what we are seeing today. Ezekiel 37 is the vision of the dry bones, which is referring to Israel being dead to the things of the Lord. But in the last days, he brings them to life. Those bones rise up. He puts all the sinews and the flesh on them. He brings them back into the land like he did in May 14, 1948. God is doing a work with Israel, and he's not finished with them yet, even though they still don't see it. They will during this time. So don't buy into replacement theology. God is still doing a work, and he has a work in store for the Jews in the future. Now, even though we, or for that matter, most Jewish people today do not know what tribe they are from, some can say, well, I'm from the tribe of Levi. Some will say, I'm, I, I'm from the tribe of Judah, and some do know, but most do not know what tribe they're from. Is that a problem with God? No. God can sort it all out. He's got 12,000 mentioned here from each of these 12 tribes. It's not an issue with God. Now, right after the rapture takes place, the bride of Christ is removed. God will save and seal this group of Jewish men. And, and from chapter 14, we know these 144,000 Jewish men become followers of Jesus Christ very quickly. They will follow the Lamb, it says, wherever He goes. They're, they're going to be the first fruits of those during the tribulation that get saved by Jesus, and these Jews will become 
on fire believers for Christ. They will be sealed for their protection throughout the Great Tribulation. Once these Jewish men get saved, they're going to be zealous for the gospel of God. They're going to be like 144,000 Apostle Pauls. Now, right now, they're more like Saul of Tarsus. Remember Saul of Tarsus before he got saved and became the Apostle Paul? Saul of Tarsus was ignorant to the things of God, very zealous for the word of God, but they didn't he didn't know Jesus until he got saved on the road to Damascus. The light bulb comes on, and he becomes very zealous for the kingdom of God, for Jesus Christ. He turns the world, and actually it says he turns the world upside down for Christ because he is so zealous for the word of God that most every place in the Roman Empire hears the gospel from the Apostle Paul. Well, there's going to be 144,000 Apostle Pauls, so to speak, all over this world. They're going to be proclaiming the Word of God, pointing people to Jesus. They're protected from all these things we're going to look at in the future in Revelation, all these demons that are let loose, stinging people. I mean, crazy stuff, but God keeps them safe. So these guys will be filled with the Holy Spirit. They will be fearless during this time. And the interesting thing is there is a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews today who I believe might make up this group of 144,000. At any given time in Israel today, there is about 150,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews known as the Herodim. They're, a very stri they're the strictest sect of the Hasidic Jews. And at any given time, from 18 to 35-year-old Jewish males, they are virgins. They take their very strict. They do not do anything until marriage. Yeah, and you know, 10 years ago when I taught this, there were 18 to 35 year olds, about 150,000. Many of them got married, moved on, but there's always more coming up. There's about 150,000 today. They're really the only people on earth that qualify to be this. 144,000. It's pretty amazing when you look into them because all they do, they, they um, do not go into the military. They're the only group that is immune to being in the military in Israel. And the requirement is they cannot work. And because they cannot work, all they do is spend their time reading and studying the Old Testament. They take all 613 laws of the Old Testament very, very seriously. They study in these schools, they're known as yeshivas, and, and they're very, very strict. They, again, they abstain from sex before marriage, and here in Revelation 7 and 14, at any given time, this group is studying the Word of God very zealously, and they have this zeal for God. It's kind of like the Apostle Paul says, though, in Galatians chapter 1, where, where Paul says that it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach, the, uh, preach Jesus among the Gentiles. So in, in Galatians 1, Paul knew even before I got saved, God was at work. Even before these guys get saved, God is at work and he is going to save them at some point during the beginning of the great tribulation after the church is raptured. Don't believe any of these groups out there. JWs were one. They're, they're one of the first ones that says, we're the 144,000. And then when they pass that mark, well, these guys are, we've got something else going on. But they're not. They're not even Jewish. Most Jewish people uh, don't recognize this, but most non-Jews that think they're Jews, they're not part of this. They have to be put from these tribes of Israel. Um, be that as it may, don't listen to any of these groups out there that think, you know, Worldwide Church of God used to say, we're the 144,000. And the other groups said, no, we are. And it's like, no, these are from these tribes. They're Jews. They're not Gentiles. Very clear. What are they going to be doing? Well, they're going to be preaching the gospel and many, many people. How many people? We don't know. Millions upon millions of people are going to get saved because of their testimony. This is how we know. Verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Notice, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, Jesus, 
clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So people often wonder, is anybody going to get saved during the Great Tribulation? Absolutely. Millions upon millions are going to get saved. They're going to be put to death when they get saved. Only the 144,000 are protected. Everybody else, because they reject the mark of the beast of the Antichrist, they will be beheaded primarily. They will die. And so here we see this great multitude. It says, from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, they're standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And I'm sure their hearts were filled with awe and wonder and amazement. You know, John is probably just blown away as he sees all these believers now there before the Lord. And as they're standing before Jesus, John notices, it says they're clothed with white robes. Again, God's grace brings righteousness upon us. And we're clothed in His righteousness. And it's depicted by these white robes. We will have white robes, as we'll see in Revelation 19, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Here it also says that they're holding palm branches in their hands. Uh, palm branches were used as a celebration of joy. It was a celebration of victory and triumph. Remember the triumphal entry of Jesus when he rides on the little donkey, they're laying palm branches before the Lord. And they're crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here in Revelation 7, we see them holding the symbol of victory and deliverance over the world, the flesh, and the devil. In verse 10, again, we see that this great multitude knows exactly who to worship and who to praise for their great salvation. Salvation belongs to who? God, who sits in the throne, and to the Lamb. Jesus is worthy of worship. Again, if he's not God, then it's idolatry to worship Jesus. If he is God, he deserves to be worshipped. They know, as all of us should know, that, not, that God is the only source of our salvation. We can never achieve salvation for ourselves, but it's a free gift that He has made possible through the shedding of His blood, the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He alone paid the price that we can never pay. He alone redeemed us, and that price was His blood. We've talked about this many, many times. How wonderful it is to know that Jesus did everything for our salvation. So this great multitude crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders, again, remember, they represent the body of Christ, and the four living creatures, those four that are circling the throne of God, fell on their faces before the throne of God, uh, before the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Usually you say that at the end of a prayer, but they say it at the beginning because they're just responding to these tribulation saints. All the glory goes to the Lord. Salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. And we, so you can learn this song, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Again, they say amen. So again, you and I will be part of this worship service in heaven. And we see the all of creation, you know, worshiping the Lord. Remember what amen means, so be it, or it is true. So we're agreeing with the tribulation saints. Yes, Jesus is the only way of salvation. Salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. And take note of this. We will praise the Lord for, and he mentions these different things here, blessing. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So we will thank Him and praise Him for all the blessings He's bestowed upon us. We acknowledge, yes, Lord, You're the source of all blessing. By the way, in the Greek, the definite article, the, is used before each one of these words. Literally, it says, the blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the might. 
In other words, all of these things are attributed to God. All power, all glory, all honor belongs to Him and Him alone. We don't glorify ourselves. We don't pat ourselves on the back and think, wow, we're so great and wonderful. No, it's all about the Lord. It says we will praise Him for His glory. Think of the glory of God. When we get to heaven, it says there's going to be no need of sun or moon in the new Jerusalem, our eternal dwelling place, because the, the Lamb... Jesus is, his glory is the light of New Jerusalem. I mean, he, his glory will just radiate throughout the universe. We also, it says here, praise and worship God for his wisdom. You know, we've already seen this many times in the book of Revelation. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He has all wisdom. He knows everything about everything. He has everything planned out from eternity past. He's got everything figured out for eternity future. God has all wisdom. And as a result of all these reasons, we will offer up thanksgiving to the Lord. All thanksgiving belongs to God. We will continually thank Him for who He is, for all that He's done for us. And we will never get bored in heaven thanking Him for being the Lamb of God that was slain for our sins. Hebrews 13, look at this verse, starting in verse, well, just 13, 15. Hebrews says, Therefore by Him... Let us continually offer the, uh, the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Continual sacrifice of praise. Notice also it says we will praise Him for His honor. In other words, we will acknowledge that God is the perfection of honor. It means trustworthiness and truth. We acknowledge all truth belongs to him. He is the most honored of all in creation and he because he's the creator. God never fails to keep his word. Uh, he honors his word and we can hold fast to his word. He will always fulfill every promise he's made to us. And so we will also praise God for his power and his might. God never gets tired. He never gets weary. You know, he doesn't like uh, nod off. Oh, what happened to Jeff? Uh-oh. <laughs> He's in trouble now. No, he doesn't get weary. He doesn't get tired. He's strong enough to heal our broken hearts. He's strong enough. If he can hold the whole universe together, he's strong enough to hold your life together. He's strong enough to hold your marriage together. He's strong enough to hold your family together. He's strong enough to repair the damages that Satan has brought into your life. Praise the Lord that Jesus is for us. He's not against us. And what a huge difference He can make in our lives if we would simply humble ourselves and ask Him. So often we don't ask Him to intervene, but we're supposed to. So often we think, well, He's running the universe. He doesn't have time for me. You know, why ask Him something if He already knows the answer? And He's probably going to tell me no. I mean, that's, we come up with all these lame excuses why we don't ask. And he says, no, ask. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Here's the prerequisite. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, in Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Notice it doesn't say if you ask anything according to your wants, your fleshly desires. No, according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, again, according to His will, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. So again, never be afraid to ask the Lord. He loves to hear from us. He wants to hear from us. Yes, we're to praise Him. Yes, we're to thank Him. Yes, we're to glorify Him. But He also wants us to ask. James says, you have not because you ask not. But he also says, and a lot of times you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your flesh. How many times have I prayed, Lord, I really want this. And he's like, nah, that's not good for you. That's not what you need. You don't need a beach house in Maui. And I'm like, okay, you know, I stopped asking a long time ago. <laughs> you know, he knows what we need better than we do. And so we need to trust him with his answer. Because he does know what we need. One of my favorite sections of scripture as far as asking is in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 9. 
Jesus says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Again, if it's according to his will, not your wants. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. That's the acronym ASK, ask, seek, knock. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, I will, uh, will he offer him a scorpion? No, not unless he's a twisted father. You know, notice verse 13, though. If you then, being evil, and that's the thing, we're all sinners. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Ask, Lord, I need more of your grace. He'll give that to you. Lord, I need more of your love. Yeah, He'll supply you with that. Lord, I need more of the Holy Spirit working in me and through me because I'm tired of quenching and grieving the Spirit. He'll do that. Humble yourself before the Lord, ask, and He will supply all that you need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 13 back in Revelation 7. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So at first John's not sure who is this great multitude. And so this elder says, Hey John, who are these people? They're wearing white robes. Where did they come from? I don't know. You tell me. And so he explains, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. In the Greek it says, these are the ones who come out of the tribulation, the great one. There's only one great tribulation. It's a seven-year period. Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Because it's going to be so brutal with God's wrath and judgment, Satan going crazy with all the demons, World War III taking place all at the same time. It's going to be brutal. And so... Here he says, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes. This is this multitude from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, that's kind of weird to think about. You ever try to wash something, you know, like your white sweater in blood? How does it get whiter? Or anything in blood? The word white here literally means glistening. Jesus causes us to start to glisten. It's not just making you white in the sense of a color. It's pure. It's holy. Glistening because of the blood of the Lamb. He washes all of our sins away. That's how powerful His blood is. Again, we see God's grace in action. Even in the midst of this most brutal time of the Great Tribulation, when God's wrath is being poured out, when cosmic disasters are you know, hitting planet Earth. But the most amazing thing is, for all those who reject the lies and the pressures of the Antichrist, who humble themselves before Jesus Christ, they will be saved. So will people get saved after the rapture? Absolutely. This is why it's important to let your friends, neighbors know about Jesus. Share the gospel with them. Because if the rapture happened today and they still haven't turned to the Lord, maybe they'll come to Christ during this time because there's a multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation. God will give these people a special task. Notice in verse 15, these who get saved during the Great Tribulation. Verse 15 says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Now remember, as the bride of Christ, we've already been promised that we will rule and reign with Jesus, probably during the Great Tribulation, or the Millennial Reign of Christ, sorry, during the Millennial Reign of Christ, we will rule and reign with Jesus. Now I don't fully understand what that's going to look like, but here with the Tribulation Saints, it says they will serve the Lord day and night. 
probably during the millennial reign of Christ. So we're going to rule and reign with him. They have a different group here. They're going to serve him day and night. There's three groups, as I mentioned last time, there's three groups that are going to be in heaven, Old Testament saints, the bride of Christ, and the tribulation saints. We're all going to be in the presence of the Lord, glorifying the Lord, but we all have a different role and responsibility. So it's not like one's better than the other, but we have different roles and responsibilities. There's only the bride of Christ from Pentecost to the rapture, and then you have the tribulation saints, and then you have the Old Testament saints who were looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Now look at verse 16. Here is an amazing promise that the Lord has for these tribulation saints. They shall neither hunger anymore. Again, there's going to be starvation happening, famines all over the world. We saw that with the opening of the third and fourth seals. It's going to be brutal. Anymore, they'll, the, the, nor thirst anymore. We're going to see that the rivers and, and the freshwater supply is going to be poisoned, destroyed, turned to blood in many places. They're not going to thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them. We're going to see the sun heated up, causing people to have sores all over their bodies. So that's not going to happen to these tribulation saints anymore, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a promise he gives them. He's given us that same promise, right? You come to Jesus, he's the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger again. You come to me, he's the one who refreshes our thirsty souls. He gives us rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit. Well, when we get to Revelation 21, we're going to see the same thing. Chapter 21, verse 4, in heaven, around the throne of God, there's neither any more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying, no more death. It's all swallowed up in the victory of Jesus. And so this is a great promise for, for these tribulation saints. Who And this is another oxymoron here. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. That's kind of an oxymoron. You don't see lambs shepherding. But Jesus is not only the Lamb of God, but he is the good shepherd. You know, he's the one that loves us. He takes care of us. Uh, Jesus keeps us well fed spiritually. Again, the bread of life. He keeps us well watered. Again, spiritually, he's the one who satisfies our thirsty soul with the rivers of living water. Let me close with a couple of verses here. Um, Psalm 23. We see the shepherd and, and us being the sheep. You're familiar with these verses. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of you have been close to that lately or recently. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Don't forget that. Whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. His rod and His staff. Ow! Oh, thanks, Lord. I needed that. His rod and His staff comforts us because you know He's watching over you. He loves you. He wants you to stay on that right path with Him. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I, all of us, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is our shepherd. And as his sheep, he tells us this in John chapter 10, starting in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. 